I can't help observing that at this very moment, in the next building along that way, there is an event that's starting on revolution. And the posters for it, which you may have seen scattered around the university, are of the moment in the French Revolution that's called the Tennis Court Oath. It's a climactic moment of, of debate among the representatives of the revolutionaries. And of course, it's got a bunch of men in 18th century costume pointing at each other and yelling in the way that revolutionaries do. Um, and it struck me as, as kind of almost symbolic in a certain way that this event on the history of Catholicism of, of the church and that event on revolutions will be starting at exactly the same moment <laughs> next to each other. Because in that juxtaposition, it seems to me there is a kind of crude version of a quite widely circulated image of the history of modernity in the West, where you have the French Revolution especially setting up a kind of trajectory of, of secularism, of modernization, for good and ill. And on the other side, you have the Catholic Church setting itself athwart that process. And of course, neither side of that is true. Um, each side of it is much more complicated. The two sides are much more sort of, sort of in, uh, intercalated than the crude story would, would have us believe. And for that reason, both sides are much more interesting than the crude version would have it. Um, so just as historians of, of Catholicism and of the church need to think about things like the secular process and, and revolutions. So I hope the people in that next building over there are going to be thinking about the church, about Catholic faith, about, about uh, Catholic experiences, at the same time as they're talking about things like voting blocks and, and uh, guillotines. Um, so the history of, of Catholicism is, of course, uh, an, in, an incredibly important thing, not just in itself, but in the context of that kind of grand view, uh, grand problem of the history of how we came to be where we are now. Um, we have as our speaker today, maybe the world's leading historian of the Catholic Church, I would think probably, I mean certainly in English, uh, John McGreevy. Um, John McGreevy is professor of history and the provost at the University of Notre Dame. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing Notre Dame correct. It, it's, taken me, <laughs> it's taken me years not to say Notre Dame, but uh, there you go. Um, he was originally educated with his bachelor's degree in history from Notre Dame, from Notre Dame um, and then took an MA and PhD from Stanford, uh, after which he had a postdoc at Valparaiso University and has served uh, on and off as uh, associate professor of American history and literature at Harvard. He's held fellowships from various organizations, the Mellon Foundation, the American Council of Learning Societies and others, um, he's also served, I can't uh, resist saying, as, as a Pulitzer judge. Um, so this is somebody that, that we really need to know if we're writers. Um, he's been at Notre Dame since 1997. He was chair of the Department of History from 2002 until 2008. It, I only became chair of the department here, I should say, six months ago, so I find this kind of inspirational. It is possible to survive. Um, <laughs> Since then, he moved on to be Dean of the College of Arts and Letters for another 10 years and has recently become Provost. Um, and I want to also point out that he's taught in high school here in Chicago. And I want to mention this as I was saying to him just before the talk, because I think teaching at high school is a uniquely testing, demanding and rewarding activity. I've never done it myself and the thought of it kind of terrifies me. but. I have enormous admiration for people who, who take on that task. It has a real sense of mission and a real cultural value. So I think it's worth noting. Um, he's published widely um, articles in organs like the Journal of American History, the New York Review of Books, uh, New Republic, Chicago Tribune and more, and four major books, starting with Parish Boundaries, The Catholic Encounter with Race in 20th Century Urban North in 1996, moving on to Catholicism and American Freedom, a history coming out in 2003. Then American Jesuits and the World, how an embattled religious order made modern Catholicism global in 2016. And most recently, which forms, as I understand it, the, the uh, frame for today's talk, Catholicism, a global history from the French Revolution to Pope Francis that came out just last year. Um, 
So with that, I'll pass on to, uh, to John to present his, title to his, his talk today, which has the title, Catholicism, A Global History. Uh, one other thing I'll mention, um, it, it's probably a good idea to silence cell phones, um, just in case they go off. Um, all right, thank you very much. So, John McGreevy. Thank you, that's very generous. Thank you to Danny Wasserman and the Lumen Christie Institute. Thank you to Professor Johns for that overly generous introduction. Um, I know it's only uh, 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 in the month of February, but I hold my book up. Your holiday shopping would be done if you were to get to buy this book right away, and so I'll, I'll refer to it in a minute. What I'll do today is talk for a few minutes about one theme of this big book, uh, and then I'll be happy to answer questions. To begin with a question, should Catholics promote democracy? Before I answer that question, I want to sincerely again thank my host at the Lumen Christi Institute and in the Department of History. I also want to explain the two reasons I wrote this book. The first reason was to make an argument. A better understanding of Catholicism enhances our grasp of the modern world. No institution is as multicultural or multilingual. Few touch as many people. The Chinese Communist Party, the European Union, the Central Intelligence Agency, and the International Monetary Fund possess global influence. But only the Catholic Church includes extended networks of people and institutions in Warsaw, Nairobi, and Mexico City, as well as the most remote sections of the Amazon. Only Catholicism counts 1.2 billion baptized members, a majority of whom, by the way, are people of color living in the Global South. Only a pope, as Pope Francis did when visiting Manila in 2015, can attract six million people, I think that's him in Manila right there, uh, in a driving rainstorm. Uh, in Manila. Historians increasingly recognize this, and the recent burst of superb scholarship on modern Catholicism is what made this book possible. Placing these dozens of really great books and articles in conversation makes visible similarities blurred when studying a single person or town or parish or diocese. The biggest change in history writing in my professional lifetime has been the loosening of the clamps of the nation state. Nation states matter for the study of modern Catholicism. I try and suggest that in the book, and you'll hear a little bit about that today. But people, devotions, and ideas cross national borders with surprising ease. The book is not comprehensive. Uh, David Bell, who's a historian at Princeton, recently wrote an essay where he worried in print about the scope of most global histories, rendering them incapable of assessing causation or even sustaining a reader's interest. Suitably chastened, I've made this as much a study, this study as much a story as my narrative skills allow, uh, sacrificing coverage for individuals and themes. Specialists will read this book and regret what is missing, and rightly so. Now, just as the first Christians in Corinth differed from the first Christians in Ephesus, no two contemporary global Catholic communities are identical. But still, the patterns of Catholic globalism in the modern era woven by migrants, missionaries, intellectuals, and diplomats, are unusually dense. So the first reason I wrote the book is to convey the importance of Catholicism as a global and a modern. Professor Johns referenced the fact that often historians begin modernity in the French Revolution, and they think of the Catholicism as anti-modern. One thing I argue in the book, and I'm not alone in arguing this, is Catholicism as not just global, but a modern institution. That's what the first reason. Second reason I wrote the book is personal. Most of my life, it turns out, I have been studying in, teaching at, writing about, and administering Catholic institutions. On an almost daily basis, I get asked, indeed I wonder, how did we get here? The long sweep of the 19th century Catholic revival after the French Revolution, the building of a vast protective milieu of schools and associations and parishes, the political crisis of the 1930s, World War II, decolonization, the events of the Second Vatican Council, now its 60th anniversary, and the end of the Cold War are the main episodes in this book. Cumulatively, cumulatively they have resulted in a church marked by unprecedented vibrancy in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, con concern for social justice almost everywhere, and global connections. I'm sure many of you have had this experience. A few years ago, 
when I was attending Mass with my family while on vacation in rural Minnesota, I learned that the celebrant was a priest from southern India. He handed out a typed copy of his ham homily so that his congregation, descendants of German and Irish Catholic farmers who had migrated to that region in the 19th century, could decipher his accented English. If we could right now pick up and fly to Guangzhou, China, and attend Mass at the Basilica there, a huge building built by French missionaries and, of course, Chinese laborers in the 1870s and 1880s, we would see not 2,000 Chinese persons at the 12 p.m. Mass as opposed to the 10 a.m. Mass. I've been to that Mass. We would see 2,000 at the 12 p.m. Mass Nigerian Catholics who are in Guangzhou as laborers. Meanwhile, in much of the world, including the United States, the number of, observ of, of observant Catholics is shrinking, even hemorrhaging. The structures built in the 19th and 20th centuries barely stand. In 2020 in Ireland, once the source of missionary clergy and women religious for much of the Anglophone world, more bishops, two, were ordained than priests, one. The sexual abuse crisis has taken an incalculable toll on survivors above all, but also on the credibility of Catholic institutions and the people who run them. The confidence of an earlier era the West German magazine Der Spiegel explained to its readers in 1962, at the moment the Vatican Council was starting, that the church had, quote, achieved a unity and consistency in teaching and structure never before seen. That confidence is a distant memory. So two reasons, placing Catholicism in the arc of global history, and second, I hope, advancing Catholic self-understanding. I'll try to achieve both ends a little bit this afternoon, and I'll talk in detail about one theme of what turned out to be a fairly big, but I insist, readable for your holiday shopping, uh, book, big book. So back to that initial question. Should Catholics promote democracy? The answer did not seem obvious in 1941. Exiled in New York City as the Wehrmacht occupied France, philosopher Jacques Maritain, and by the way, uh, I first started reading Jacques Maritain's correspondence, I read a lot in France, I read some around the world, uh, in Regenstein Library, about three blocks from here. He had a number of correspondence from the University of Chicago. Jacques Maritain, who I argue in this book, is the most important Catholic intellectual of the 20th century. He asked his friend Yves Simone, also exiled from France, also ended up teaching at the University of Chicago, he was then teaching at Notre Dame, he asked Simone for a favor. Could Simone run to the library at Notre Dame and confirm that Thomas Aquinas, quote, understood that consent of the people is required for the legitimacy of the state, end quote. Simone supplied the citation bitterly. Both Simone and Maritain knew that Catholics around the world during the 1930s had admired Austria's Engelbert Dollfuss, who had dissolved the country's parliament in an effort to build a Catholic state. Other Catholics lauded Portugal's dictator, Antonio Salazar, who was a former Catholic youth leader who also declared, quote, the obsolescence of democracy, the obsolescence of political parties based on the individual, the citizen, or the elector, end quote. In France itself, after the occupation of the country in 1940 uh, by the Wehrmacht, many Catholics, maybe even a majority of Catholic intellectuals, if you read the literature on the topic, had rallied to the banner of the authoritarian Vichy government. So to talk of Catholic democracy in this context to Simone as he wrote to Maritain in those fervent days of 1940, only trash. The, uh, the antagonism of Catholics to democracy, the obvious antagonism of Catholics to democracy is, quote, the problem we are asked to overcome. Now, our own democratic crisis in the United States in 2023 is prompting a scholarly outpouring. Investigators don't devote spe special attention to times and places where democracies reverted to dictatorships as in Europe in the 1930s, South America too, in the 1970s. Harvard political scientists Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt, authors of what I think is this kind of superb general interest text on the topic, How Democracies Die, confirmed the diagnosis made, 60, uh, I mean made uh, 90 years ago by Maritain and Simone. They observed, uh, and I'm talking here about Ziblatt and, and Levitsky here, how a hierarchical Catholicism rested uneasily next to a democratic politics of compromise, negotiation, and unpredictable outcomes. Now, they note that some Catholic leaders and Catholic countries, 
Belgium is the example they dwell on for a while in that book, resisted authoritarianism actively, but others welcomed it in the 1930s. Now, if we step back, and this is what I try and do in the book, and take a longer chronological view, we can complicate this story. Many Catholics in the early 19th century, and this literature is just emerging in, in, in the, as, as a scholarly literature, but I think it's hugely important. Many Catholics in the early 19th century, especially in Spain and Latin America, urged Republican and Democratic governments. After helping draft the first constitution in Spain's history in 1812, some Spanish priests and bishops required it to be read out loud in all of Spain's churches. Their peers in Mexico City did the same thing. When Mexico, the first Mexican constitution, was drafted after the country gained independence in 1824. When Alexis de Tocqueville, it's mandatory for historians and political scientists, anytime, anywhere, they give a talk to quote Alexis de Tocqueville, but this is a true quote. When Alexis de Tocqueville shot at fame with the 1835 publication of the first volume of his Democracy in America, he identified Catholics in the United States as the most, I'm quoting, most Republican and Democratic class in the United States. Why did he say that? He said, the equality of all believers within Catholicism, rich, poor, different colors, different races, that means that Catholics are predisposed to favor Democrat government. He rejected the claim made by radicals during the French Revolution that, quote, the Catholic religion was the natural enemy of democracy. Many of these same Catholics in Spain and Latin America and in other parts of the world too, usually, and of course I, I stress this, educated male lay elites favored representation within the church, not just represent, representation within the state. They desired voice on the appointment of bishops, a process that up until the late 19th century and really up until the 1960s was controlled in many places by governments, not by the Pope. That is, governments appointed a strong majority of the world's bishops in the 1820s and 1830s. Governments and prime ministers and, and, and monarchs uh, appointed those bishops, not uh, of the Pope, and these lay Catholics who were favoring democracy as a political system wanted some voice in this process. The founding figure of Canadian nationalism, Louis-Joseph Papineau, demanded the placement of notables, that is, wealthy lay people, on parish councils, itself an innovation of the early 19th century, so as to avoid a, quote, taxation without representation. Priests or bishops spending donated funds without accountability appalled him. Can anything, he asked, be more anti-national or anti-patriotic. Now in the mid-19th century, this nascent alliance between Catholicism and democracy unraveled. Pope Pius IX, whose reign lasted from 1846 to 1878, retreated into a defensive stance after the revolutions of 1848. He felt the need to defend the church against liberal governments, which were, after all, willing to expel priests or nuns and seize church property. So that, that need was more pressing. Authority and justice became the Catholic political keywords, not representation or voice. Authority and justice, not representation or voice. The job of lay people, and I'm putting this more crudely than it really was, became to obey priests, priests had the job of obeying bishops, and everyone had the job of obeying a pope defined as infallible at the First Vatican Council in 1870. Building the milieu of churches, schools, and associations as protection against an often hostile world seemed more important than engagement, at least at the theoretical level, with democratic politics. Now, to be fair, Catholics in much of Europe and South America did form confessional political parties in the late 19th century. So famous was the German Catholic party called the Center Party, or Zentrum, uh, and its leader, Ludwig Winthorst, that German Catholic migrants, when they moved to Texas, named a town Winthorst after uh, their leader in Germany. And the same group, uh, uh, another group of German Catholic migrants, this one from Bavaria, moved to Saskatchewan, and there's a town named Winthorst uh, in, in Saskatchewan. In Anglophone countries especially, Catholics thrived, uh, Irish Catholics in particular, thrived in local and national politics. One child of Irish Catholic migrants, Al Smith, ran for president as the first Catholic nominee of the Democratic Party in 1928. Another child of Irish Catholic migrants, James Scullin, was elected Prime Minister of Australia in, 1820, uh, in 1929. But Catholic theory lagged Catholic practice. When challenged uh, by his opponents to explain Leo XIII's uh, encyclical arguing for a unity of church and state, 
the sickle was written in the 1880s, uh, Al Smith, in 1928, famously responded, what the hell is an encyclical? He'd never heard of an encyclical, um, and, and that seemed far more abstract than the hurly-burly of Tammany Hall politics where Smith was so adept. A more dominant pattern uh, after World War I was for Catholic intellectuals and politicians to express doubts about democracy's future. Of the 28 European parliamentary democracies in 1920, most of them in majority Catholic countries, and we could talk about that, uh, 13 had become authoritarian in 1938. So 28 parliamentary countries in 1920, 13 had become authoritarian by 1938. Democracies weakened or collapsed in South America's largest countries, including Brazil and Argentina during the same interwar period. Let's see if I get this. This photo here is of the building of the famous Christ the Redeemer statue over Rio de Janeiro's harbor in the early 1930s. You can't quite see the people uh, below the statue, but it's about half bishops and about half of the country's leading politicians. This is a grand ceremony kind of opening uh, the monument. Almost all of them, the politicians and the bishops, are Catholics fairly sympathetic to authoritarian rule. Democracy was the dog that did not bark in Catholic social thought. Pius XI uh, offered a condescending appraisal of, quote, modern democratic states, which were most exposed to the danger of being overthrown by one faction or another. Vatican officials withdrew their support from Italy's Catholic Democratic Party, the Partito Popolare, in the mid-1920s and decided to negotiate instead with an often hostile but sometimes conciliatory Benito Mussolini. The leader of the Partito Popolare, Father Luigi Sturzo, fled to London and then, like Maritain, with whom he became a good friend, fled to the United States. Munich's Cardinal Michael Fallhaber uh, was a vigorous opponent of the early Nazi movement, and the Nazi movement started in Munich. But Fallhaber viewed democratic politics with almost equal disdain. He didn't like the Nazis, but he didn't like democracy. He was dismayed that there was no God recognized in the Weimar Constitution of 1919, and he advocated for monarchy over Republican institutions all through the 1920s and had a famous debate with the young Zentrum leader, uh, Konrad Adenauer, who becomes the leader of West Germany after World War II, on that topic. In 1934, just to remind ourselves, if I get this, uh, the Vatican negotiated a treaty with Hitler's Germany uh, in an effort to try and protect Catholic institutions, and that's a group of Nazi and then Vatican officials, and the, the man in the center there is Eugenio Pacelli, who becomes Pope Pius XII in 1939. This was the world that Jacques Maritain sought to change. He was an unlikely reformer. In the first years of his career, he saw little merit in democratic government. The more I think about it, he wrote to a friend in 1914, the more I am persuaded that we must have a political doctrine. Remember, Maritain was a neo-Thomist philosopher and he had interest in aesthetics. He didn't really write much about politics in his early career. We need a political doctrine, and this doctrine can only be anti-revolutionary, anti-republican, anti-constitutional, and therefore monarchist. That's what a great Catholic intellectual should be advocating for, Maritain in 1914. But in the late 20s, he shifted gears. He published an essay, a kind of famous essay, arguing that Thomas Aquinas had actually favored democracy as a form of government. I don't think medievalists are entirely convinced of that claim, uh, but it was important for Maritain to make that argument, and he directly challenged his one-time mentor, the Dominican priest and very prominent theologian, Reginald Garajou Lagrange, the most prominent neo-Thomist in the world and a top papal advisor, Garajou Lagrange thought only incompetence ran for office in democracies. And Garajou Lagrange, not surprisingly, in 1940, would support Vichy after the Nazi invasion. Maritain, by contrast, in his 1936 masterpiece, Integral Humanism, outlined his Catholic and democratic vision. The flourishing of the human person, person's a big term for him, required respect for her embeddedness in communities such as families, professions, and churches. Catholics should not translate theological hierarchical categories into politics, and they should welcome, this is a little bit bold in 1936, uh, pluralism. I, I could talk a lot about Maritain during these 30s period. He was the, one of the first readers of the Karl Marx manuscripts from the 1840s. He had a very sophisticated view of political economy, and he was deeply committed by this point to democratic governments. And indeed, democratic governments, he argued, with universal suffrage for women as well as for men, followed from this distinction between religious and political authority. 
Maritain promoted his version of democratic personalism around the world ceaselessly in the 1930s. So here, here is Maritain in uh, Warsaw, and uh, uh, he, he just basically traveled everywhere. Uh, in Italy, where many Catholic intellectuals supported Mussolini into the late 1930s, Maritain's ideas thrilled a cadre, a cadre of young activists disenchanted with Mussolini, including Father Giovanni Martini, the future Pope Paul VI, whose father had been active in the Partito Popolare. Maritain also sailed to South America in Rio de Janeiro and Buenos Aires. His lectures attracted the country's leading intellectuals. He persuaded the director of Brazil's most influential think tank to identify himself as an open Maritain Catholic, democratic, and reformist. His exile in the United States between 1940 and 1944 deepened Maritain's convictions. In 1941, he defended democracy as a system of government superior to any alternative. It is necessary to show, he told Simone, remember they're corresponding constantly, trying to figure out how Catholics should survive World War II, it is necessary to show that St. Thomas was a Democrat, Aquinas. In this sense, the gospel works in history in a democratic direction. In 1942, he coordinated the uh, drafting of this manifesto in the face of the world's crisis, signed by 43 European Catholic and European and Latin American scholars who are sojourning, as they put it, in the United States during the war. They've escaped Europe or they've escaped Latin America and in the United States during the war. And the, the, the document argues that democracy is the issue at stake in the struggle. And we think that Pope Pius XII, who famously and kind of cautiously with many caveats, endorsed democracy in 1944, had read not only this document, but Maritain's writings on democracy during the 1930s. These ideas of Maritain underwrite one of the key achievements of 20th century political history, Christian democratic parties. After almost a century, from the mid 19th century to the mid 20th century, of doubting the uh, efficacy of democracy, at least in Europe and Latin America, Catholics, it's a remarkable transition, became its guarantors. For all or part of the period between 1945 and 1980, Christian democratic, often deeply Catholic parties had held power in Italy, Germany, Switzerland, Belgium, the Netherlands, Austria, Brazil, uh, China, uh, Chile, Venezuela, Ecuador, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Costa Rica. Even parties not formally identified as Christian democratic, such as the Mouvement Republican Popular in France, the Democratic Party in Uganda, the Indish Catholic Party in Indonesia, or the Fianna Fáil in Ireland, they're not formally Christian Democratic parties, but they are in effect. They support trade unions, they want family allowances, they hope that women won't have to work outside the home, they urge Catholics to participate in democratic governance. Now, not only Catholics belong to Christian Democratic parties, and they were never controlled by the institutional church, but the lineage is direct. By 1960, the list of Catholic presidents and prime ministers who explicitly say they are influenced by Maritain is striking. It includes Konrad Adenauer in West Germany and Alcide de Gaspari in Italy, leaders of Europe's most prominent Christian Democratic parties. It includes Robert Schumann, the prime minister of France for a year and then kind of the founder of the European Union. It includes Charles de Gaulle, who corresponded with Maritain during the war and appointed Maritain as ambassador to the Vatican and told him you need to get rid of some of these bishops who had supported Vichy and Maritain, working with Pius XII, did. It included no Jin Dem in South Vietnam, although no Jin Dem's commitment to democracy was at best partial. It included Leopold Senghor in Senegal, raised in the French Empire, and Benedicto Kiwanuka in Uganda, raised in the British Empire. If you went all the way out to 1970, people who claim explicitly to have been influenced by Maritain, you would include Eduardo Fry, the president of Chile, Rafael Caldera, the president of Venezuela, even Pierre Trudeau, uh, the Prime Minister of Canada. Now this list does not include John Kennedy, uh, the first Catholic President of the United States, whose intellectual formation was innocent of Maritain and Catholic social thought, but it did include his brother-in-law, Sergeant Shriver, uh, explicitly a devotee of Maritain, the first founder of the Peace Corps and the War on Poverty. It even included, if we are to believe, President Biden, who has a, as much affection as I have for him, has a penchant of exaggerating his family stories. It even included Joseph Biden Sr., who Joseph Biden Jr. Said, rare, says read Maritain thoughtfully in the 1950s. Now that may or may not be true, um, that, Maritain's, uh, that but Joe Biden's father was reading Maritain in the 1950s. But even the misremembering 
by our current president, I think is significant. Okay, so that's uh, uh, on the left, Alcide de Gasperi, Conrad Adenauer in the center, Robert Schumann on the right. And some people would say the three founders of the European Union, all German, native German speakers, all coming from minority regions within their country, home country, and all deeply and profoundly Catholic. That is Nyo Jin Diem, and in his background there, you can see President of South Vietnam, Catholic President of South Vietnam. In the background, you can see his brother, who's the leading bishop in South Vietnam, and an interesting interplay there between church and state. There is John Kennedy, one Catholic president, and Benedicto Kiwanuka from Uganda, another Catholic president. Now, Maritain found vindication at the Second Vatican Council, in part because his old friend, Pope Paul VI, had by 1963 become Pope Paul VI, and Paul VI guided the discussion of the final document of the Second Vatican Council, Gaudium et Spes, which sketched the importance of all citizens taking an active part in public affairs. The impact of this formal Catholic of endorsement of democracy at the Second Vatican Council was immense. In the 1950s, intellectuals were writing a lot of books saying, we wonder if Catholics and democracy are compatible because of the hierarchical church. By the 1980s, scholars are starting to marvel at Catholic capacity to further democratic government. I, you know, Jonathan Earle and J.J. Carner have recently told the story of Benedicto Kiwanuka, that guy here, the longtime head of the Democratic and deeply Catholic party in Uganda. Kiwanuka was inspired by Christian Democrats in Europe. He becomes prime minister in 1961 and then chief minister in 1962 in Uganda. He welcomed the work of the Second Vatican Council and he was dismayed when Idi Amin took control of Uganda in 1971. He cautiously accepted an appointment as Chief Justice of the equivalent of the Supreme Court in Uganda. And of course, Catholics in themselves were never a particular target of Idi Amin's wrath, but any independent source of power was. Uh, and Amin soon embarked on a campaign against foreign influence in Uganda that extended to Catholics as pawns of a global church. Uh, he arranged for the kidnapping and murder of this man, Kiwanuka, as Kiwanuka left morning mass. And we think now Amin pulled the trigger himself. Amin later ordered the assassination of the priest editor of the country's leading Catholic newspaper, in part for his investigation into Kiwanuka's death. That is, Kiwanuka is a martyr, a Catholic martyr, uh, for democracy. Outcomes in East and Southeast Asia in the 1970s and 1980s were much happier. Seoul's Cardinal Stephen Kim, appointed by Paul VI in 1968, becomes the country's leading advocate uh, of democracy. He had grown up in a poor family in South Korea and then moved to Germany, became acquainted with the documents of the Second Vatican Council, and really came back on fire with the idea of bringing South Korean Catholics into engagement in the public realm. And his cathedral in Seoul became the locus of the pro-democracy movement. In the Philippines in the 1980s, it was democratic leadership. Here are two nuns standing, trying to protect the crowd from the Filipino military of Ferdinand Marcos, the authoritarian government of the 1980s. It was clearly Catholic groups inspired by the Second Vatican Council who took the lead uh, in fostering efforts, uh, pro-democracy efforts in the country. If we do nothing now, the bishops wrote as they tried to maneuver Menar Marcos out of the country and give the leadership of the country to Corazon Aquino, uh, the widow of one of the Catholic political leaders who had been killed by the government, if we do nothing now, the bishops wrote, we would be party to our own destruction as a people. Probably the most thrilling events occurred in Poland. Six months after his election in 1978, John Paul II returned to his own country, native country. The crowds packing every event in that first John Paul II pilgrimage in Poland were extraordinary. We think 25% of the Polish population saw one of the masses he did during that week. And they signaled not only a disenchantment with the communist regime, but a, a, a new vision for how Catholicism can articulate demands for democratic government. John Paul II did not cause the formation of the independent trade union Solidarity the next year, but he did awaken consciences, in the words of Timothy Garton Ash, uh, in part because of that papal visit. Within a year, Solidarity had enrolled 10 million workers, and the epicenter of the movement in Gdansk, Poland, was a Catholic epicenter. At the end of every day, uh, Mass was said at Shipyard Number 10, and Lech Valencia would come out after Mass and talk about the strategy of the Union. The collapse of communist rule in Poland and Eastern Europe rested more on Mikhail Gorbachev's unwillingness to send tanks to Warsaw, Prague, and East Berlin than these efforts by Polish activists. But the Catholic role, again, in favor of democracy, was again vital. 
As the Polish economy crumbled in the late 1980s, desperate communist leaders permitted the first free elections since the 1930s, and the political party formed out of solidarity registered stunning triumphs. The party did best in regions where mass attendance was highest. And in 1989, Tadosz Maziecki, friendly with John Paul II since the 1950s, a close observer of the council and a founder of solidarity, became the first non-communist prime minister of Poland since before World War II, and in his opening address to the country, quoted Gaudium et Spes on democracy. These 20th century triumphs, Catholics de demanding democratic governments, and even as with Kiwanuka in Uganda, uh, becoming martyrs for that cause, they now seem as if from another world. We still have the occasional Catholic defending democracy in public and vigorous ways. We have the nun, uh, Sister Rose Nutuang, who was photographed two years ago in Myanmar uh, in front of tanks trying to protest government action. Hong Kong's Martin Lee, who's been imprisoned by the Chinese Communist Party for three years. But in Europe and South America, Christian Democratic parties have gone into eclipse. In the heavily, overwhelmingly Catholic Philippines, a dictator, Rodrigo Duarte, has kind of run roughshod over the Constitution. And in the United States, the most significant democratic crisis since the 19th century now envelops this country. A majority of Republican Party candidates elected to the House of Representatives in 2022 denied the legitimacy of the 2020 presidential election. One Catholic representative from Arizona, Paul Gosar, uh, peddles the false narrative of election fraud at every opportunity. A recent Catholic convert and current Ohio Senator, J.D. Vance, called, J called Donald Trump reprehensible in 2016. Uh, but Vance, who knows better, now thinks just a few bad apples, that's a quote, distorted the peaceful intentions of the January 6, 2021 mob at the Capitol. So why has the Catholic response to the current democratic crisis been so muted? The Catholics have forgotten, I want to argue, what Maritain taught them. In the 1970s, skepticism about democracy came from the left. Latin American intellectuals, many influenced by liberation theology, chided Maritain and Christian Democratic parties for supporting, quote, naive reformism. They weren't radical enough. Now a much greater threat to democracy comes from the populist right. In the United States, I would argue, controversially, the distorting effect of a 50-year single-minded Catholic focus on abortion plays a role. Some Catholic pro-life activists lionized former President Trump, vocally pro-choice early in his career, despite his efforts to thwart the 2020 presidential election. And even as the Democrats and Republicans descend into a spiral of polarization, some bishops, including Denver's bishop Samuel Aquila, uh, complain about Catholics who are overly concerned about civility and engagement. Nothing could be fur further from Maritain's commitment to democratic practice. In 1942, even as Maritain is trying to rally Catholics around the world, and writing to Charles de Gaulle to support democracy, uh, he publishes a scholarly essay on Machiavelli. Well, he does this because he wants to stress the noble vocation of the politician, politician in a democracy. He doesn't like the term, if you read the essay, Machiavellian. As in the 19th century, doubts about democracy in the public realm segue into doubts about democracy within the church. Some of the same figures trampling on democratic norms in the public arena opposed the efforts of Pope Francis to reconsider representation within the church. One of Francis's ecclesial antagonists, Archbishop Carlo Maria uh, Vigano, the one-time Vatican nuncio to the United States, called on Francis to resign and then released a series of really, I think, unhinged letters uh, and videos supporting President Trump. He connected a deep state with what he called a deep church. Francis, by contrast, and interestingly, has made synods central to his papacy picking up a thread left dangling at the end of the Second Vatican Council by Paul VI. Now, a synod is not a legislative assembly, as Francis would be the first to tell you. Its participants are not elected, they do not pass laws, they do not vote. But they exist as a mechanism for allowing diverse voices to participate in the governance of the church. In the early 19th century, and I developed this theme in the book, Catholic reformers drafting some of the world's first constitutions, transferred ideas about representation and voice from the political to the religious sphere. They wondered how lay people might be re represented within a church led by ordained clergy. Derailed in the 19th century 
by an ultramontane devotional style that had a far more sure popular touch. That movement towards synods was, as I said, resuscitated at the end of the Second Vatican Council. Sixty years later, it's taking center stage. National synods are underway in Germany and Australia, and the Germans in particular build on a long tradition of clergy, nuns, lay leaders, uh, and bishops gathering for discussion. A massive synod is planned for Rome in 2023, and now again in 2024, with participation, really unprecedented participation, from Catholics from around the world. Francis thinks contemporary Catholics can develop new mechanisms for discussing the problems and opportunities that confront them. He's also been vocal in his support for democracy around the world. We wonder, we might wonder, will this synodal experience have political spin-offs? In 1941, in one of the letters in Regenstein Library, actually, that I came across, Maritain considered writing an updated version of the Federalist Papers. Now, he never did this, but he thought about it. Applicable to the entire world. We could use such a document now as Catholics strategize on how to prepare fractures within church and nation. Where does this story about democracy and Catholicism fit within the bigger picture of global history and global Catholicism? Francis says that we live in, not in an era of change, but a change of era. Let me say that again. We live in not an era of change, but a change of era. Certainly within the church, that's true. This afternoon, I'm not talking about the other core themes of the book including the rapid shift of gravity within Catholicism from the global north to the global south. One-sixth of the world's Catholics, by the way, now live in sub-Saharan Africa. I haven't talked about the sexual abuse crisis, which I treat in the book as an organic development of church structures built in the 19th century and just as global, tragically, as Lourdes Grottoes or neo-Gothic churches. But my point is this. Something fundamental is shifting in this change of era in our religious, our political, maybe even our ecological habitats. Catholicism as an institution will be reinvented in the 21st century, much as it was in the 19th. We just don't know how. And if this book provides a savvy baseline as the process of transformation unfolds, it will have served its purpose. Thank you. Thanks so much, Professor McGreevy. Thank you. Uh, I haven't had the pleasure of reading the book yet, but I'm very excited to do so. But you will, it will be a major I, Christmas gift. It you. will, major yeah. Major. Um, so my name is Renee Roden, and I live at St. Francis Catholic Worker in Uptown. Mm -hmm. And I can't, as, as you mentioned, Jacques Maritain is such a, a central influence of so many Catholic political leaders and parties. Um, I'm curious if you talk about in the book or if you could talk about now his influence on a very different kind of politics of Dorothy Day and Peter Morin and the Catholic worker um, and what that mutual influence was in New York or if that plays how, out at all. How, uh, how wonderful that you're doing that work. You know, thank you and congr congratulations. So Maritain, I, I, I'm a slightly obsessed with Maritain. I admit that, okay? And, and if you read the book, uh, when you read the book, uh, you will see that each chapter I have a kind of personal story. Uh, and Maritain is threaded through a couple of different of the chapters. He's important for the story I tried to tell today about politics. He's really important for that story. He's actually important for his writing on aesthetics. Um, he hated neo-Gothic churches and Lourdes Grottoes and the piety of the 19th century revival. He was a bit of a liturgical snob, okay? But he had a whole theory behind that. Uh, and so Catholic modernism in the arts in a good bit springs from Maritime. There are other people involved in that. And I talk about a woman named Dominique de Menil, who's the founder of the de Menil Gallery in Houston, who was deeply influenced by Maritain. Okay. He's also influential with this idea of personalism with Dorothy Day and the Catholic worker. On political economy questions, Maritain's quite far to the left. I don't know if I'd call him a socialist, but he's, he's close. He's not a radical socialist in the way that Day was and Peter Morin, but that sense that the person is at the center of the world and, and at the center of a just society Maritain and Day, who met on Maritain's first trip to the United States in 1934, they shared some beliefs. He, he thought Day was a hero, um, and he admired her. He did not live in poverty the way that people do in the Catholic Worker Movement, but he admired her very much. Um, now, later in his life, he grew to really love the United States and admire the United States. He thought he was a sort of, I would say, 
standard European skeptic of the United States in the 1930s, but came to admire the, Demo the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and wrote very admiringly about America in the 1950s. Some people think that's the conservative Maritain, and the more radical Maritain is the Maritain who's reading the just translated writings of the early Marx from the 1840s, reading them in the 1930s. It's, it's an interesting story. So I hope that gives you some flavor. He has a, a, an, an influence on the Catholic worker movement, but of course Day and Morin are far more important uh, for that movement. Yes. We have a question from our online audience. So this is from Juan Neves. How did Catholic missions or evangelization affect the trades that you speak about in your lecture? Did contact with other cultures, governments, cause changes in the thinking of the church? Such a great question. A lot of the book is about Catholic missionaries. The great Catholic missionary period is kind of roughly from about 1840 to, let's say, 1960. It's the period of the revival of the church in Europe after the chaos of the French Revolution. And there are hundreds of thousands of primarily priests, but also large numbers of women religious who leave Europe and go around the world. In the 19th, and, and so the foundations in a way of the global church come from that movement because often the first Catholic converts in a particular place uh, convert because of the European missionary influence, but then of course it, it metastasizes in the best sense of the term uh, and becomes you know, much bigger and, and, and kind of more organic within the particular country, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also in East Asia. In the 19th century, um, they exported a Catholicism they did not want to change. And so you can go to Hanoi and you can go to Santiago and you can see a Lourdes Grotto at you know, 20 different churches and you can see the same paintings of the Sacred Heart and you can see the same neo-Gothic church designs in tropical Indonesia. Okay? They were exporting a Catholicism from Europe that they did not want to change. They did make the church global, profoundly global. But globalization in this instance did not lead to liberalization. It meant exporting a 19th century Catholic world. That starts to change profoundly in the era of decolonization. And I have a chapter on that topic. Decolonization is absolutely central to trying to understand the global church. And I, I think we need so much more historical work on this. But essentially, figures like Leopold Senghor, who's educated in Catholic schools, becomes a member of the French parliament because Colin, he's come from Senegal, which is part of the French regime uh, up until the early 1960s. Senghor starts to argue we need an African Catholicism. We need a Catholicism that doesn't just take a 19th century European and say that is the normative Catholicism. We need something different. And so instead of exporting, the term, which is actually invented in 1962, becomes enculturation. How can Catholicism actually be enculturated in new societies, in, 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 in newly Catholic societies, not new societies? And in some ways, it's an extraordinary success. Okay, the number of Catholics in Uganda is far higher right now than it was 50 years ago, and it's in large part because the Second Vatican Council in particular picked up on that theme of enculturation. I mean, one small note, one of the great advocates of enculturation in the 50s and early 60s and the document on missions at the Second Vatican Council was, it's a surprise, twist answer. Ratzinger. Ratzinger. You know, who was one of the great theologians of the conciliar period, Rossinger is arguing this is now a global church and we have to think about that. Later in life, he becomes much more skeptical of um, you know, liturgical innovations uh, around the world. Uh, but at that moment in the 60s, he has adapted that new language which is shaped by decolonization and shaped by the day-to-day the -day experience of missionaries as they encounter indigenous Catholics. I hope that's helpful. Well, you sounded a bit to me like uh, a representative of the German bishops yeah. uh, today, uh, with your <clears throat> with your emphasis on the synod, on yeah. synods on democracy. But yeah. but be that as it may, I, I'd I'd be interested in the ecclesiological dimension of uh, this thrust for democracy. Take Maritain or take any one of the nineteenth century. Yeah. Uh, um, proponents of democracy, uh, 
uh, what's the ecclesiolo ecclesiological consequence and where is the ecclesi ecclesiological thought in all of this? Yeah. So you are right, have already pushed me to the limit of my ecclesiological knowledge. <laughs> so I say this with, I say this as a, you know, this a thing rarely that the provost says with genuine humility, you know, um, not feigned humility, genuine humility. In the 19th century, what I talked about today, um, lay elite, I want to emphasize elite, these were nobles often and, and very prominent, started agitating for democratic representation within the church. And that movement was entirely derailed by the ultramontanism, the, the, what we think of as the 19th century devotional movement, which had a far more sure popular touch. Okay, it spoke more than the devotions favored by these elite lay people to the vast majority of Catholics who are migrants, who are working in brutal jobs, who are traveling around the world trying to figure out how to survive. That was a more popular piety, a populist piety, including the focus on the Pope. Now, in the world that we're in, where fum in a fumbling way, you know, backward then forward, but ultimately forward, the major institutions of the world, and I mean by that corporations and universities and all other kinds of other institutions, have moved more toward norms of shared governments and transparency. What will be the Catholic response to that world? I don't think it's democracy. Families aren't democratic. The University of Chicago is not democratic. Uh, I say that with stress, neither is the University of Notre Dame or, or, or your average you know, grade school or something. There are lots of successful institutions in the United States that are not in the world, that are not democratic. But how do you give voice and representation in a more sophisticated way in, the 20, you know, in our 21st century? I think that's a profound question. That doesn't mean women should be ordained priests, and it doesn't mean we should elect bishops. Both of the, uh, I would love to see women priests. I do not want bishops elected. That would be a catastrophe. Um, what it does mean is we have to think hard uh, as Catholics about questions of representation and voice. And we, that, that has been opened up, uh, I think, in the Francis papacy in an interesting and new way. So that doesn't mean I would agree with everything coming out of the German Synod, but I do agree with the idea of synodal thinking and governance and new modes of representation and voice that will take into account lay Catholics. I think we need to, un, as I say this as a Catholic, un, in our, our halting way, move toward that. Yes. Uh, so we have a question from Lumen Christi's artist, our writer in residence, Kenneth Woodward. Um, John, can you say something more about Maritain's influence on Catholic writers through art and scholasticism and later creative intuition in art and poetry? And can you explain why he became disillusioned with reform as we read in The Peasant yeah. of the Garon. First, uh, Ken Woodward, I do know. Hello to Ken Woodward, hi. Uh, 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 and I hope you're, what I, I assume your weather is better in Florida than it is here in Chicago. Uh, so Maritain is an interesting figure, again, in this way. He writes a book three years after the Second Vatican Council that is, I think, a very sour book called The Peasant of the Garon that sort of says we've blown it at the council because its pace of change is too fast. I think there's actually something to that. Sociologically, the pace of change was incredibly fast in that period from 1965 to 1975. It's almost unbelievable, the changes. And Maritain thought it had gone too far, unquestionably. I, I'm not so sure about that, but that's an interesting conversation to have. In the 40s and 50s, um, he's writing about politics, but he's writing even more about art. And those are the two books that uh, Ken Woodward refers to. They had a lot of influence on what you might call the Catholic literary revival of the 1950s, and writers like Flannery O'Connor and others. Flannery O'Connor is a big Maritain devotee. She says she's a hillbilly neo-Thomist in a famous letter. Um, and other figures around the world, uh, the, um, I'm blanking on his name now, I have it in the book, the Jap uh, Sh Shusako Endo, uh, uh, the Japanese novelist, deeply influenced by Maritain at the same moment. So Maritain is not the only thread, but he is a common thread for Catholic intellectuals and artists in the 1940s and 50s. Um, architects, painters, uh, uh, and, uh, and novelists. He, had a salon, he and his wife had a salon in Paris up until 1940, and then when they ultimately moved back to France, they try and reconstitute that for a brief period of time. 
that was hugely influential. So it's a, it's a big part of the story. Now this is only a few pages in the book. I will say, I said to uh, uh, Danny earlier, you know, I don't think there's a great maritime biography. And if some graduate student out there um, can write a great maritime biography, we, would, we could benefit from that. It, it's a massive task. He wrote dozens of letters every day, most of which have been saved in cramped you know, French handwriting. But it is, he's, he's profoundly important. So, uh, well, first, just thank you for the, the talk and for the interaction with the Q&A, which is just wonderful. Thank you. Um, I guess I wanted to ask something that's a little bit off to one side. It's about the status of being a lapsed Catholic and how that's changed over time. Because certainly in literature, you think yeah. obviously most famously Graham Greene, yeah. the lapsed Catholic is like a, you know, like a bad, it's a bad thing to say. It's almost like a kind of wandering Jew figure, yeah. somebody who, yeah. who is there through history and kind of mediates things. I, I certainly haven't thought that through, um, but you're absolutely right. It is a, a kind of category now. Oh, I'm sorry. The question was, how do we think about lapsed Catholics? So just in, as even cultural figures. Uh, I, we say this right in the University of Chicago Divinity School, which some people would say is post-Protestant, right? It's a Divinity School, but it's also post-Protestant in some serious way. It's not profoundly, deeply Protestant as integral to its mission. It's something a little bit different than that in the same way that we say, um, you know, what does it mean to be a secular Jew? I mean, that, that's sometimes a kind of complicated category. And lapsed Catholic is another complicated category. It really only, I think, well, I, I don't know if I really believe, I have to think this through. I haven't thought through fully yet. There's a way in which it too, you know, is a product of the secular age. And, and that category comes into being almost the post 1960s. Before that, at least in Western Europe and North America, you're kind of in or you're out. And you're not Catholic or you are Catholic. And the idea of lapsed and cultural Catholic parallel to, I think, similar phenomena within Judaism and Protestantism is something really worth investigating. Because you could pretty quickly, you know, do we count Robert Mapplethorpe, the controversial artist, as Catholic? Well, in some ways we do, right? Yeah, the imagery, the, his upbringing, you know, was he an observant Catholic in the ordinary sense during the period when he was making his art? Absolutely not. So there's just a lot of complicated figures like that. Well, I think I'll have to close with that. Uh, let's thank our speaker one more You're time. You're very generous. Thank you.